Well, good morning. How are we doing? Are we, you guys, uh, some of us are still kind of um, in this spring break mode, okay? And the, the spring break mode, the, uh, coming back from the beach is just kind of late. So I'm going to say it one more time. How are we doing? Okay, good, good. It's, you know, it's post-Easter, and so this is an exciting time because, you know, we, we celebrate the resurrection, we celebrate the empty grave, and so that's really the series that we're kicking off today is Beyond the Tomb. What does it look like, what does it mean for us as believers now that Jesus has conquered death, that he has conquered sin, and we are his followers, what, what does that mean for us? Well, it's a big deal for us. So if you wouldn't mind, open up your Bibles to Jesus. John chapter 20. John chapter 20 is where we're going to be camping out this morning. And um, as you turn there, we're going to be reading verses 19 through 29. Now, I, I do have a question I want to ask everybody. When you were growing up, did you have a nickname? You can just show by, you know, nodding your head or doing this. Okay, was, there was a nickname for you growing up. Some of you may be very proud of that nickname. There might be some of you, though, however, are not too proud of that nickname that was given to you. I had some really good nicknames. I had Z-Man. I had, um, well, I had some, but I'm not going to share all of them, Okay. But because there are some that I, I, if I shared this with you today, I would never hear the end of it, okay? And I, I don't want to share it with you because I just, I'd be feeling that, you know, frustration because some of the nicknames were not all that good. Now, I do have a pop quiz for all of us today just in regards to nicknames, but it's not going to be each other's nicknames. It's going to be nicknames that we see with the disciples, okay? Now, if I give you the nickname of The Rock, who are we referring to? Peter, there you go. Okay. Now, let's, let's go a little bit step for question number two on this pop quiz. If I gave you the nicknames, the Sons of Thunder, who am I referring to? James and John. I mean, that's like a great wrestling duo, tag team duo name. The Sons of Thunder, okay? Because um, they wanted to call down, if you know, recall, they wanted to call down thunder and lightning on anybody who opposed Jesus, okay? The Sons of Thunder. That, I mean, I could just see James and John wanting to wear a belt, okay? A big, uh, you know, wrestling belt wherever they go, okay? So you got the Sons of Thunder. Now, how about, how about this one? The Betrayer, Judas. Now, you don't want to have that nickname, Okay? That's not a good nickname to have, the betrayer. And that every time his name is mentioned in, I mean, not every time, but almost every single time his name is mentioned in Scripture, there's almost like a little tagline. I mean, this is even before you get in the chron chronological order of the Scripture into that passage of him actually betraying Jesus, that they're already giving you a heads up. He's going to betray Jesus. He's the betrayer. You don't want, you don't want that nickname. Now, let's, let's go a, a little bit further here, and this might not have been, it's not written in Scripture, but it could have been their nickname. How about if they were, let's say, let's put this way, the Roman hater. Who would be called the Roman hater out of all the disciples? Ooh, Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot, the Zealots, they, they were against the Roman Empire, they were against Roman oppression. In fact, their hope was that the Messiah would come in and take over not only Jerusalem, but all of Israel and overthrow Rome, overthrow Caesar. That was their belief. So you got some Roman haters, you got Simon the Zealot there. Now, what about a Roman sympathizer? Who would have been the Roman sympathizer? Matthew, Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew, the tax collector, who was, in a sense, working for the Roman government. And it's interesting that both of them are followers of Jesus. And I mean, it doesn't tell us of who went with who when Jesus sent them out two by two. But wouldn't that have been comical if Jesus said, Simon the Zealot and Matthew, you guys go together. Talk about politics of the day. No, I'm not going to do that. But that was, I mean, you could kind of imagine that that was probably uh, maybe a nickname that they had in their grouping. Now, let me ask you this question, final question. Who was named the doubter? Thomas. Thomas the doubter, which I, I think is pretty unfortunate, you know. Um, Tom, I mean, once again, it's my middle name, and so I don't like that, okay. Thomas the doubter, but it's, it's also interesting that even though we call him the doubter, in reality, all of the disciples doubted. 
All of them did. Did you see any of the disciples just sitting there at the tomb three days later, just waiting for it to open up? No, not one of them. They had to be all told that Jesus had risen. So Thomas is not the, the only doubter, but also it's interesting here that as we're about to get into this passage, which talks in, regarding Thomas doubting, that um, we, we actually assign that even that name of a doubting Thomas to someone who is skeptical by, by what they hear. And, and what has been lost to history is that while Thomas starts off as doubting, by the end of this passage, he makes a confession of faith. In fact, he is the first disciple after the resurrection to call upon Jesus as his God. The first one. So let's give, let's give Thomas, okay, a little, a little bit of some credibility here. But let's open up John chapter 20, giving you enough time now. We're going to start in verse 19. We're going to go all the way through verse 29 in our time together, but we're just going to read to verse 23 here first. John 20, verse 19, if you got it, say got it. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, if you're taking notes, uh, I want you guys to write this down. Our first point in our time together is this. When, when it comes to peace, and Jesus says peace three times in this passage, peace is not given to us to stay passive. Peace is not given to us to stay passive. We're, we're supposed to be active in our faith. We're not to be coasting in Christianity. He says, peace be with you. Now, sometimes when we hear peace, when we think peace, you know what we think? We think beachside. <sighs> or we think mountains. We just think climbing up to a peak in a mountain, just seeing the valley and a river below, and you're like, ah, <clears throat> peace. Can we be kind of passive? But Jesus is not meaning that because as soon as he says peace with you, he says, the Father sent me, I'm going to send you. See, locked doors don't provide peace. They don't. The doors, they were shut and locked. You believe that? They're shut and locked. Nevertheless, Jesus joined them. And, and Luke's account, he tells us that his appearance was so inexplicable by conventional means that the disciples actually thought he was a ghost. This isn't the first time that Jesus was thought to be a ghost. Remember him walking on water to his disciples? And like, who is it? I don't know. It's a ghost. I'm not a ghost. So, and he has to do this again, in a sense, here. He's, he, has, he says, here's my hands. Here's my side. He had a physical body. As we had read earlier in this chapter, in verse 17, Mary touched him. So he has a physical body. In the next chapter, you're going to see him eating with his disciples. Okay? Spirits, I mean, he's not Casper the friendly ghost where you're going to see food going right through him. I mean, he has a physical body. He was no mere phantom. In Luke chapter 24, verse 39, and recalling the, the, the resurrection, Jesus states this, See my hands and my feet, it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. See, his resurrected body, it had no material limitations. He got behind locked doors. This is his resurrected body. And the apostles later tell us that we're going to have a body just like our Savior. Isn't that time out? I don't know if you think about that. But isn't that pretty cool? I mean, we're, we're talking teleportation, you know? I mean, just boom. I mean, remember him walking with the disciples, the road to Emmaus? And he's engaged in a conversation with them. They're talking about the events of the day. And on that walk, he begins to share with them, really pretty much proving to them of why the Messiah had to suffer, why he had to go to the cross. I mean, wouldn't you love to be in that conversation? I mean, that's like the best theology class you could ever get at seminary. Walking on a road, listening to Jesus go through all the Old Testament scripture. And then when they're about to go and they're, they're turning and they see that Jesus is about to go farther, they don't know it's Jesus. They bring him in to have a meal. And as soon as he breaks the bread, poof, he's gone. 
and they realize it was the Lord. He has that type of body. It defies physical limitations, and we're going to have that body. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. I can't wait because with all the aches and pains, you know, that we have. I'm turning 40 this week, folks, and it's, I'm already feeling it, all right? Here we go. See, as we, as we see here in Scripture, the scars have not been removed. You would think with this new physical body, defying these physical limitations, that it would all be, all be good. But no, no, no. God, for a reason, the scars are still there. You know why? I believe because they will serve as an eternal reminder to us of the sacrifice that he made for you and for me. It gives us another reminder while we worship him, why we worship him. You know that Jesus will be the only scarred person for eternity? Think about that. He'll have those scars for the rest of eternity. And we'll get to see him just like those who see him today. And Jesus states that as soon as he is among them, peace be with you. He states that three times in this passage. Why? Because they were terrified of the Jews. They were terrified that they did this to our master. They they got him killed on the cross. We're next. Because typically when you're going after a master, when you're going after a rabbi that you disagree with or the religious elite disagree with, then they're also going to go after those who follow him. So they're behind locked, closed doors. But Jesus enters and he speaks peace into their turmoil. You know what Jesus does the same thing today? He speaks peace into your turmoil. They're behind locked doors and they have a decision in this moment. Do I choose fear or do I choose faith? Are we put into situations like that ourselves? To to choose fear or to choose faith? You know, Lord, I, I know that you proved yourself then, but I don't know about now. Yeah, 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 God, I know that you, you sure showed up and you provided with that, but I don't know if you're going to provide today with this. Choosing fear over faith. Question for you, what do you fear right now? What, what scares you? You know, I, I believe this, as we grow older, our fears change. I don't see that many 50-year-olds scared of the dark, anymore. I don't see them, you know, getting night lights and putting in the room, you know, when they go to bed. Our fears begin to change. It could be the fear of failure is a, is a fear that you have. You, you, you want to do well in your job. You want to do well as a parent. You want to do well as a spouse. So there's this fear of failure. There also could be a fear of success, that you've done well and now it's expected of you to do that and even better. And so you have this fear. Now I got to provo- keep on delivering. So you have this fear of success. It might be even this past week making ends meet with paying taxes. Like, Lord, are we going to, is this going to work? So you have this fear. Could be fear of a loss of a loved one. See, whatever your fear may be, Jesus wants to break through and give you peace. See, the Father had sent Jesus on a mission. It was for the redemption of man so that all would believe in him, they would receive eternal life. And Jesus accomplished his mission. And now he's telling his disciples, be, have peace. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, now I send you. Our peace does not make us passive. The, the disciples now doesn't mean that they just coast. They were to be active and on mission. And what was their mission? Their mission was to tell others of how Jesus accomplished his mission. Accomplishing his mission of the redemption for all man through his death on the cross. You see, Christ's forgiveness is our proclamation and the Holy Spirit is our power. That's in your notes. See, Christ's mission Christ's mission was for our redemption. So Christ's forgiveness is in our proclamation, but we don't go on our own power. We have the Spirit abiding within us who provides us that power. Now, I want to stop for a minute. In verse 23, I don't want to just skip over verses. Say, oh, that's a difficult passage. Let's just skip it. No, we, we want to look into the text and we want to dive in. In this text, it can be somewhat confusing. Verse 23, he talks about what we're supposed to be proclaiming. After we receive the Holy Spirit, see, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, just stopping a minute, you know, and there's different views on this passage. In Catholicism, there's a different view on this passage than Protestantism. 
And there's a lot of things that we agree with with Catholics. We believe that Jesus is God's son. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in family. We are pro-life. There's a lot of things that we agree on, but here there are some different views. Catholics read this verse and they interpret it that when a priest says that you are forgiven, then God forgives you. So you see the, the process there? That if it's first man and then God. Man forgives and then God just gets in on it and then yes, you're forgiven. Protestants would say that God has already forgiven you through Jesus Christ, so then we proclaim that forgiveness of Christ. See the difference? God forgives, man proclaims. God forgives you of that sin if you come to him in faith. See, all throughout scripture, there is never a time where a man forgives sin because that would be considered blasphemy. That, that happened with Jesus. Remember the, the four faithful friends that are bringing their friend who's a paralytic to Jesus? They, they find out there's no room, so they said, well, let's get creative. Let's cut out a hole and let's drop them in in the, in the middle of the, the room. And as he is laying there in front of Jesus, Jesus turns to the paralytic man and says, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, hello, time out. Even the religious leaders were saying, you, you can't do that. Only God, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And then Jesus turns to them, would it be easier for me to say, pick up your mat and walk? But to show you that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, I say to you, pick up your mat and walk. And what does he do? He picks up his mat and he walks. See, only God can forgive sin. Only God can. And Jesus was called out, like I said, in that, that miracle. And so, but we, like we said, only God can forgive sins. And there are two views here. And so, of course, if you are asking me, of course, I side with the Protestant view. And here's why. The Lord commissioned his disciples to proclaim a message of forgiveness of sins. The, the phrase that we just read here, they are forgiven them. That's called the divine passive. Everybody say divine passive. What, is, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Divine passive means this, it's a passive voice and a perfect tense. Meaning it's describing an already an action taken by God that has ongoing results. So God has forgiven us when we place our faith in him. So then we as believers, as followers can then proclaim that forgiveness if they receive faith. So if someone comes to you and says, I wanna place my faith in Jesus Christ and they do that, you could say, your sins are forgiven you. You didn't forgive the sins. God did. You're just proclaiming to them and letting them know of that message of forgiveness. See the difference? See the distinction here? And this is, dis this is consistent with Jesus' ministry. While he healed and he forgave individuals, he said it was their faith that saved them. It was their faith that made them whole. What is it that condemned them? It was their unbelief. We can... Also proclaim that message that if you do not place your faith in Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you of your sins, your sins will not be forgiven. Therefore, the wrath of God is upon them. So right here, it's not that we have the authority in saying, okay, you're forgiven, you're not forgiven. No, 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 no. God has already forgiven those who place their faith in him. Now we proclaim that message. So not only do we proclaim the message of forgiveness, but we have the Holy Spirit that empowers us with that message. And Jesus even illustrated his promise of the coming Holy Spirit by breathing on the disciples. He comes in, peace be with you, and then, <sighs> doesn't that be a little weird? In our Western thought and mindset, if we were sitting in the room, Jesus shows up, we go, whoa, he goes, <sighs> I'm sure Jesus had great breath, okay? I mean, just smelled amazing. But, what is, he, what is he doing in that moment? Well, we, remember we did a two-part series on the work of the Holy Spirit and the name of the Spirit, which, means, which is pneuma. Remember that? And the name pneuma means what? Breath. So what in, some interpreters are saying here is that Jesus is visibly and physically doing something that is letting them know of a gift that they're going to receive spiritually. Visibly and physically, what they're going to receive in a moment, spiritually, when the Spirit comes at Pentecost. You know what he's also referring to? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. You know what happens in that passage? God 
creates man in his own image. And out of the dust, out of the dirt, he (sighs) breathes life into him. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel sees a valley of dry bones. And the question to Ezekiel is, can these bones have life? And he's like, only you know, Lord. And it was a prophecy to tell that only the bones that could have life is from the breath of God. And the Spirit comes as Jesus told them. And so since we have the message and the power of the Holy Spirit, we proclaim with boldness. We don't stay behind locked doors with our message. Our mission isn't to stay behind locked doors, but thinking, how can the kingdom expand? Let me ask you this question. How can the kingdom expand when you're living in fear? You can't. That's why he's given us himself, his spirit, to speak. All right, verse 24. Let's pick up and read to verse 27. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, there's another nickname, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. There's excitement here. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked. You see that again? They're locked. There's no confidence. There's no boldness. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand here and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe, which leads us to our next point. Despite our hopelessness and doubt, Jesus draws near. Jesus offered the same greeting of peace be with you. And then guess what he does? He immediately gives attention to the one who has the biggest needs in the room. Peace be with you. And he makes a beeline to Thomas. His gentle rebuke, in effect, is saying, it's okay to place your confidence in me. I won't let you down. I'm here. I'm real. And I won't abandon you. See, we call him Doubting Thomas, but Jesus did not rebuke him for his doubts. He rebuked him for his unbelief. Remember what he says here? He says, don't disbelieve, believe. Doubt is often, it's a cerebral problem. We want to believe, but our faith is overwhelmed by difficulties and questions. I I see this in our culture today, that our emotions dictate our doubts. Here's what I mean by that, is that we're wanting our doubts to be met with a change of emotion. So if there's a change in emotion of confidence, then that means that it's true. If I feel confident, then there are no doubts. Like, I feel like God is telling me to do this. Or, I feel like this is the right thing to do. I remember with my my wife, and we worked in student ministry for a long time, counseling teenage girls, and I remember having this conversation many times, I just feel like he's the one. I just feel like he's the one. See, for matters of the heart, you think with your head. I just feel like he's the one. And I said, no, he's not the one. What? What? I can tell you right now, he's not that. Well, well, why? He doesn't have a car. <laughs> he doesn't have a job. I can tell you right now, his, his, your dad's going to disapprove of this. He is not the one, at least right now. But I feel confident that he's the one. So I have no doubts because I feel this confidence. See, emotions don't bring truth, but truth can bring emotions. It can. I'll, I'll put it this way. If you and I went to the airport and we got on a plane... And we discovered that the pilot did not show up. And we're supposed to get to this destination in order to get on time. I just say to everybody on the plane, I get on the mic and say, don't worry, folks. We're going to get there. I'm going to fly the plane. And the reason why I'm going to follow the fly plane, I feel confident in my abilities to get this bird up in the air. I've seen both of the Top Gun movies. <laughs> I'm a maverick in mindset. We're going to get there. You know what you'd be saying? You're crazy. I'm getting off the plane. But then somebody shows up, someone that you and I both don't know. They show up and they show their credentials that I've been a pilot for over 30 years flying for Delta and I'm going to take over and fly the plane. (sighs) Okay, you can take over. Why? You have now confidence in that truth of that information that was shown in their credentials. See the change? 
It's not wrong that Thomas is doubting. You can doubt in your faith. What, what Jesus rebukes is your unbelief. You might have doubts. I've had doubts in my faith. But you know what the great thing about God's word is? That he proves himself time and time again through his word. C.S. Lewis put it this way with regards to God's word, that God's word is like a lion. You just open up the cage and let him defend himself. It can defend itself, God's word. So it's okay to doubt, but don't let that turn to disbelief. See, Thomas had a flood of emotions. Excitement was hitting him from all over, in a sense, for all the other disciples. We've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. No, not unless I see his hands, his side. See, investigated doubts lead to a stronger faith. Because when you dive into God's word, he proves himself more and more, and there's more and more evidence. It's okay to have doubts. Jesus isn't questioning doubts, but unbelief. Warren Wiersbe once wrote this. I love this quote said, Thomas is a good lesson and warning to all of us not to miss meeting with God's people on the Lord's day. Because Thomas was not there, he missed seeing Jesus, hearing his words of peace, and receiving his commission and the gift of spiritual life. You see what, Jesus, what, what Thomas missed out on? Eight days he was hopeless because he didn't meet with the gathering of people on the Lord's day. Now I'm speaking to the choir here. You're here but you miss something when you're not here. You miss experiencing what God wants us to experience. And see, he could have experienced peace and joy that whole past week, but he neglected to meet with the others and he was robbed of a blessing. Let's pick up in verse 28 and close our time together. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God, this is key. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Which leads us to our last point. There is blessing in a personalized faith. There's a blessing in a personalized faith. Thomas cries out, my Lord and my God. Thomas's confession is a challenge to all of us, not only to believe in the resurrection, but also in the divinity of the one who rose. Jesus says that those who will believe without seeing for themselves will be uniquely blessed. You know who he's talking about? You. You know who he's talking about? Me. We haven't seen, but we believe. And if we believe, we'll be blessed. See, such belief, it's not foolish, it's not gullible. God offers abundant evidence from multiple firsthand witnesses. In fact, he has preserved for us the same testimony from the same witnesses that Jesus even criticized Thomas for not believing. I mean, if you go to, to Israel, I mean, we've been there now three times coming on four that we have seen excavation sites with archaeolog archaeologists that every single time it proves Scripture is true. We have the evidence. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, attaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, there's blessing in a personalized faith. God doesn't have grandchildren. He has children. Just because your parents are saved doesn't mean that you're saved. We don't have a hand-me-down faith. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a Christian. Billy Sunday once said this, a great preacher, years past, talking about, you know, our faith, talking about, you know, going, going to church. He said, going to church doesn't make you a Christian, just like standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. See, your faith must be personal. But not only that, we're blessed when we have faith, even when we don't see him. Does this mean that our faith, faith is weak? No. Our faith is grounded in fact, proven by eyewitnesses just like John. You know, Thomas demonstrated hopelessness for those eight days. It's a scary thing when you have hopelessness. Studies have shown that individuals with increased hopelessness have a greater risk of premature death, cancer, and heart disease. Employees with higher levels of hopelessness have reduced job satisfaction, have greater burnout, and subsequent higher absenteeism, which is a study in 2014. See, we tend to place our hope in many different things that have backfired on us. Some place it in the stock market. <laughs> Some place it in the government. 
Many of us, I mean, even this past March, including myself, were putting our faith that UNC would go to, the bra- go to March Madness. How did that work out for us? I mean, as a Cardinal fan, I have faith every single year that general management will invest in pitching. They don't. And look, that's backfired. See, we place our hope in so many different things that tend to backfire. You place your hope in people. You place your hope in family and friends. Place your hope in yourself. See, we don't put our faith in a brand. We put our faith in a person. We don't put our faith in a denomination. We put our faith in a person. We don't put our faith in a church. Church doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. See, we can place our faith, our hope, and trust in Jesus who has never failed us. But not only that, God is not just, Jesus is not just a God to billions who call upon him. He is also a God to the individual, to you, to me. That's why Thomas said, my Lord, my God. He's a personal God. He's a personal God that wants to have a relationship with you. If you don't have a relationship with them, you can call upon him, ask for that forgiveness that only he can forgive. And that when you place your faith in him, you have a personal relationship. Because here's the deal. He's never going to leave you. It's not going to abandon you. He's, He's dependable. He loves you sacrificially. In fact, he sacrificed his own life for you. This is the God that we serve. But not only that, he empowers you as well to tell others of that free gift so that they can join with us and with Thomas thousands of years ago and say, my Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. Father, we thank you that you are our God and that you sent your son to die in our place so that we can have a relationship with you. That when we place our faith in him, you forgive us of our sins. That we place our faith in the God-man, Jesus, that he is fully God. Lord, I pray that we walk in boldness, that we would speak in boldness, like Thomas in this moment, that we won't live behind locked doors and scared of what other people think about us and our faith. But we won't have a passive faith, but an active faith. Proclaiming your good news. Lord, we need you and thank you so much for your spirit that empowers us with that mission. So Lord, I pray in this time that we have together as we respond to your word, that you'd be honored, that you'd be glorified. And not only that, Lord, that we would respond in boldness as you want us to. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? In our time together, in our time of response, maybe for you, you might be thinking, you know, Zach, I got a, I got a passive faith. I really haven't been active. You know, that's okay. First step is recognizing it. Second step is repenting of it. You just need prayer and encouragement. You can come down for it. We're going to have staff available down here that we'd love to pray with you. Maybe you haven't found a church home and you haven't had that opportunity to come on a weekly basis and to a place that you can call home. May the village be that church. To not neglect meeting with God's people is what Hebrews tells us. We'd love to talk with you about that as well. Or maybe you just want to come forward and the altar is open. You just want to pray to God, asking him to give you the boldness to share your faith and to make him known with that mission that he gave not only his disciples, but to us. However, the Lord is asking you to respond. You respond to be obedient. As we sing, let's respond.